If I were to ask for a show of hands this afternoon, how many here are long-suffering? If I were to then turn around and say, how many here are tolerant? Would we know what's been asked in each question? I think a great many people think of long-suffering as tolerance. But in the Bible, it's not used that way at all. If you look throughout our land, all sorts of strident verses are raised in the everlasting louder crescendo pleading for tolerance. In the religious world, it's the same thing, religious tolerance. They may say something like deeper understanding. And they will use something like, we need more of the Spirit of Christ. All of that may sound good, but first of all, I like for those people to tell me what they mean by those terms. But what's interesting about this, especially in social matters, is that so many folks who pride themselves in just tolerating everything, turn out to be some of those intolerant people on the face of the earth when their view is not accepted and if any other view is offered against them. And thus we have what's happened over the last few years as far as our country is concerned. The woke mentality has arisen, which means you accept what I say in my view or we will oppose you, we will fight you, we will stop you, we will kick you out, we will trample you underfoot. But that's just, of course, hypocrisy. It's redefining terms to suit themselves. Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was the great propagandist of the Nazi government in Germany, always pointed out that you simply charge your enemies with the very thing you're doing. And it causes people to focus on them and not on you. So no matter how wicked it is, you're doing this, that, or the other, or not doing it, you don't put the spotlight on you, you turn it on them. And that's just the way a lot of things are, and especially in moral and religious matters. We're taught plainly that we are to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. American Standard Version 1901, Jude 3. So obviously, while you bear with people and you suffer along with them, you do not compromise the truth and you actually refute error and defend the truth, or else Jude 3 makes no sense whatsoever. People, though, like for you to tolerate them in their sins. And the sad part about it is if we don't watch out, we can deceive ourselves, that is, tell ourselves a lie and believe it to be the truth when it comes to justifying things in our lives that need to change that are not in harmony with God's will. And we find ourselves full of good intentions, but year after year we have those good intentions, but really what we're saying, I tolerate sin in my life. And I keep putting up with it. I do not do what's necessary to get rid of it or to incorporate the good principles of Christian living into my life, whatever must be done to do that. You find when you begin to examine doctrines of men that purport to teach you the way of righteousness, the way to heaven, the way to salvation, you will find that they will be very intolerant when you begin to say, well, let's take the Bible. You believe it to be the final authority. 
And if they don't, you certainly want to try to work till you find out what that final authority is they think they have. But be that as it may, for those who say the Bible is the very word of God given from God to us to guide us, when you start applying the truth of the Bible to whatever men teach, and the truth shines a bright spotlight on error for what it is, error, then you find out they become very intolerant. And that suits Satan just fine because that keeps you in error and lost. I say you, I mean any one of us who would operate that way. When you look at the world around us, How much tolerance is permitted where truth and error are in conflict on anything? Not just religious truth and error. I read this thing, and I wouldn't have gotten any other way, as to how much tolerance will we accept when it comes to aircraft engineering and design. I'm told that it's one one hundred thousandth of an inch that is tolerated. Well, that's pretty small. Seems very intolerant to me. Just allowed that much. Well, when you're flying in one of those things, sometimes you wonder if that's not too much. It just doesn't take very much deviation from the way that thing's engineered and built to put it on the ground or never get it off. And because human lives are at stake and certainly would be in jeopardy if people believed in tolerating error in aircraft engineering and a lot of other places, then uh, tolerance, liberal tolerance would hardly be allowed. Now we've all gone to doctors and had prescriptions written. Do you want the pharmacist to fill that prescription just exactly like the doctor wrote it? And if you say, well, I'd like a little deviation, how much deviation would you tolerate in it? We don't think that much along that line. Well, our Lord's the great physician. And he's given his prescription in the New Testament as to what one must believe and from the heart obey to be saved from sin. How much can we deviate from it? Would you be willing for the farmers just, just to, to guess on the ingredients and put together that prescription? But when it comes to our soul's eternal salvation, we uh, want to be very tolerant. We've got to understand that suffering long with people does not mean in the process of long suffering with them, we're not showing them the truth to expose error. God's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. But what's supposed to be going on all along? The truth of God is being preached to show that people who need to repent must repent. So how vital is it to understand the difference in suffering long and tolerating something that's wicked? When you look around us, we're being told that's all right and about every level of society. Even to the point of what we heard for years, don't judge me. Well, when you read your New Testament, God's already judged and here's, a, here's the way he says it. If we are going to be saved, we must understand and obey his will. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Or going back to the pharmacist. The doctor could say, why call you me doctor <laughs> and don't fill my prescription like I wrote it? Well, the great physician's prescription is exact, perfect, Doctors can make mistakes. Pharmacists can make mistakes. No matter how hard they try, how learned they are. But when it comes to Jesus, there's no mistakes. So he would say, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And 
you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. Obviously, we would not tolerate deviation in any form or fashion. Now, what's interesting, while God is very long-suffering, 2 Peter 3, 9, not willing that any should perish, he is very intolerant. And the Bible is full of material that shows he is intolerant. I do not hesitate to say that we serve an intolerant God. Question, was he tolerant with the people before the flood? He was long-suffering, but he was not tolerant. He knew exactly the wickedness they were doing. And it says plainly, as Peter quoted, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Thus preaching was done all that time saying, better change. So he was long-suffering, but he wasn't intolerant. Genesis chapter 6. In the Old Testament, further, you come to the Tower of Babel. God had said to disperse and go throughout the world. The people didn't. They stayed in one place. They all spoke the same language, and they got pretty proud of themselves, thought they'd build a tower, reach even to heaven. Well, God had no problem stopping that. He just made it where they couldn't communicate with one another. And those who could speak a language all gathered together. And those who could speak another language all gathered together. And they dispersed. And that's how God got them to do what they were told to do in the first place. But he didn't put up with it. Genesis 11. The wicked people of Sodom, specifically homosexuals, lesbians, transvestites, or whatever else was there, God was not tolerant with him at all. How do I know? He destroyed them. Was he long-suffering? Yes. He gave them plenty of time to change. Notice long-suffering is teaching people the need to change and giving them time to change. You do not condone, tolerate, or compromise the truth to put up with their sin. And that's the difference. God destroyed them, he destroyed them with fire. And they are set in the Old Testament and then referred to in the New as an example for us to understand better that God means what he says and says what he means. Now, the next two men can't give their testimony, but if Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, priests of God, were to ask how intolerant God was concerning the unauthorized strange fire that they offered, you'd find out they would say rather quickly, he didn't put up with it. That's there in the Old Testament. Romans 15, 4, written for your learning and mine to make us appreciate and respect the authority of Christ and that he means what he says and says what he means in the New Testament. They were killed for their disobedience, Leviticus 10. And then the one that's quite amazing is Uzzah when they were transporting the ark. Now, they had the law of Moses. They had ignored how the ark ought to be transported. David wanted it moved, the house of Obed-Edom, into Jerusalem. They did not consult the authority of God. They did not consult what God thought about the matter. So they built a brand new cart and had these Oxen pulling it. I have no doubt that Uzzah meant well. That he was sincere. And he was going along. The ark was on the cart. There was a stumbling and he just simply did what anybody would do. Steady the ark with his hand. God killed him. Why is that in your Bible? Just an interesting account. Or does it further say God is an intolerant God when it comes to men trifling with his word? So, Uzzah stands up and cries aloud, you better pay attention to what you believe and what you do or don't do. 2 Samuel 6, 3-6. through 6. 
The writer of Hebrews said this because he referred greatly back to the Old Testament events to teach us under the New Testament. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense reward. Now think about that. Did any, did any transgression or disobedience escape God under the Old Testament? What if we can believe the Bible? The Holy Spirit said through the writer of Hebrews, every, now how many is every? None left out. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Hebrews 2 and verse 2. So it is not showing forth the Spirit of Christ or Christian love or true godliness by tolerating error, which God has openly opposed when he's as plain in the Old Testament as it is, and in the New Testament said, every, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Now you have to ask yourself the question, why are these things in my Bible and what do I get out of them when I read them? I said we serve an intolerant God. What about Jesus? I'm trying to show the difference because the Bible makes that difference in tolerating things and being long-suffering with people. Jesus, being God in the flesh while he's on the earth, was very intolerant. Something of the Spirit of Christ, people want to talk about that, and in doing so, corrupt it to mean put up with the sin I'm in, and say nothing about it. But think about even the forerunner, John the Baptizer, the Immerser. Notice what he said concerning the fact that Christ, the Messiah, is coming. He rebuked the Jews and he said this, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring therefore fruit meat, which means suitable for repentance. Matthew 3, 7 through 8. Uh, who's saying this? The one who prepared the way for the Son of God to come before he ever got here. And you see that John showed no tolerance for Herod's sinful marriage. Even though it cost him his life, he still boldly declared, it is not lawful for thee to have her, his wife, who was really his brother Philip's wife, Luke 3. That's the reason it wasn't lawful for him to have her. So the harbinger of our Lord set the stage for his uncompromising, intolerant teaching. From the first, Jesus was intolerant with all those who opposed what he taught. Remember how he said, you have heard that it hath been said, and he said, but I say unto you. He gave no further proof than himself and his claim of divinity when he said that. Oh, he's doing the miracles, he's doing the other things, but when he's teaching, he's saying, that's what you've heard, but I say unto you. That's one reason they would say he didn't teach like the scribes and the priests and other teachers, but he taught as one having authority. His Sermon on the Mount was intolerance in that truth opposed error. Jesus showed no tolerance to the hypocritical religious leaders of his day. And he asked, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Matthew 15, 3. He rebuked many times and many times his scathing rebuke showed no tolerance as he pointed out their sham and their hypocrisy. Just go over and read Matthew chapter 23. And he Skins the bark off the tree with those people. No tolerance. Notice what his attitude is toward those who wouldn't accept what he taught. I've quoted it many times already. You know it. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. 
the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. That's no tolerance. No tolerance shown at all. And he made it clear, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Matthew 24, 35. Do what you want, act like you will, the word will read the same, mean the same on the day of judgment as it does now. He showed no tolerance with the money changers in the temple in Matthew 12 and verse 12. And you talk about the Spirit of Christ. The scourge that he made showed the Spirit of Christ against those who would make his father's house a den of thieves. His show of intolerance toward the Jews led them to seek to kill him. Now granted, if you speak like the Lord spake because you live like the Lord wants you to live, you may have all sorts of things done to you. Here's the point. He showed no sign of compromise at all. My meat is to do my Father's will. He says, I came to do that. You'll find that our Lord was also intolerant with his own church. Now remember, don't confuse long-suffering, suffering long with people, with being tolerant. You remember he promised just to build one. We talked about that this morning. And he prayed against every other one that would rise to compete against it. John 17, 20 and 21. John 17, 20 and 21. And in that prayer on the night before his crucifixion, the following day, he would recognize the division that would arise. And as we've known it for 500 years and even more, he knew that that would be the seedbed for people to become atheists by saying, you claim a Christian, I can be unified. I'm reminded of an atheist in the 19th century who debated a sectarian preacher. And he told the preacher, he said, you don't even believe your own Bible. And that offended the sectarian preacher greatly. He said, I can prove it to you. And the man challenged him to prove to him that he didn't believe the Bible. The atheist just read Mark 16, 15, 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth that is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. What do you think that passage means? Which immediately he said, well, it doesn't mean you have to be baptized to be saved. And he said, see, I told you you didn't believe the Bible yourself. And here you are debating me because I'm supposed to be an atheist and I am. But why should I believe you when you are a practical atheist in the first place? When it comes to a point in the Bible you don't believe, you won't follow it. He purchased the church, his church, the church he built with his own blood, Acts 20 and 28. And he became the head of it, the only head of it, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, 18. He is the savior of that one church, Ephesians 5, 23. You know what that means. Every church established by men thereafter were spurious and counterfeit. He's intolerant. When it comes to what church he will save. He made that clear to the Jews in his earthly ministry. Every plant to which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Matthew 15, 13. Now did he show any tolerance toward plants others planted other than that one that his father planted? He's not going to tolerate me when I say, well, I was sincere and I believed in Christ, the Son of God, but I was a member of this other church over here than the church that is revealed on the pages of the New Testament. Think he's going to be tolerant about that? He's a very intolerant Christ. Intolerant to the point to where truth must be accepted. And that's the way it's going to be. No other way. Same is true of the plan of salvation. Our Lord is very intolerant. 
Which part of the plan of salvation can you exclude and it still be the plan of salvation? You say you don't have to hear the word of God and understand it pertaining to Christ and him being the son of God and the savior of the world. You can't reject that. Jesus even told the Jews, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. That's pretty blunt. Sounds rather intolerant to me. And he made it clear that it would be folks many, even at the time Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, as he forecasted it in Matthew 24, false Christ will arise. Many shall come and, and declare themselves, and, they, and many will follow their pernicious ways. But it didn't change the fact that he was the Christ. He even says, you can deny me, but I can't deny myself. If we work out belief and say that, we can get rid of that. Or if we accept belief, belief only, and get rid of repentance and confession and baptism, that's all right. No, it's not. He's very intolerant about that. So when it comes to all these things, the doctrine of faith, repentance, confession of faith in Christ, baptism, He's not going to allow any of that to be set aside. What about the significance of the church and where he puts the church as we studied this morning or puts the members, those who are saved in the church? That's what he does. If you from the heart obey that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, and 18, you're baptized into Christ as a penitent believer. He's going to add you to his church. He's not going to put you anywhere else. Now, you may choose to run off out here and do all sorts of things, but that's not going to change what the Bible teaches. I don't doubt today, especially with the lack of regard there is to God's doctrine, that we've had a lot of folks who started out in the church of Christ that are running around off of here in denominations because they've been converted to denominational theologies, the false doctrines of men. But let me ask yourself a question. Does that change the last will and testament of Christ regarding the plan of salvation in the church, its organization, work, and worship. Still there. And what he's saying is, it'll face you on the day of judgment. And there'll be many on that day say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many? Well, oh, there are going to be some folks there that expect him to be tolerant. We've done this, we've done that. No argument. Depart from me. I never knew you. An everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, that sounds intolerant to me. But the day of judgment will be a day of intolerance for those who refused all their life to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their souls. The blood of Christ saves us when we submit to the plan of salvation and are baptized in the death of Christ as believing penitent persons. And that's the only time the blood of Christ will be applied to wash away sins. If you haven't been baptized into the death of Christ, you're still in your sins. And you're baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Well, we're the spiritual bride of Christ and members in particular. We have placed into our hands the gospel the teaching of the truth to others and to ourselves to be edified as the church. Don't you think we ought to be intolerant like Christ? If you say, no, I don't want to be that way. Why? He's your pattern. He's left you an example that we should walk in his steps concerning being persecuted in every other way. We look to Jesus, the author of our salvation, in every way and form. He is the example. We want to be just exactly like him. Long-suffering with people, well, let's look at how he dealt with the disciples for those three and a half years, the apostles followed him. But look at what he did to Peter. But he's trying to tell them, I must go up to Jerusalem and there be 
found uh, guilty by the scribes and the Pharisees and chief priests and put to death, Peter said, oh, no, 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 not you. Remember what the Lord said to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Well, I think of a lot of members of the church that if they embrace some false doctrine and you told them that, they'd run you off. But that's what Jesus said to Peter of all people. You could not find a more devoted person than Peter to Jesus Christ. He blundered a lot of times. <laughs> that reminds me, Jody and I heard a little thing yesterday that Winston Churchill is purported to have said, referring to a pretty important, the name there was called, uh, diplomat. <laughs> this sounds exactly like Winston Churchill. He said he's the only person I ever, or the only bull I ever saw carried his own china shop, china shop around with him. <laughs> well, there's a lot of us like that if we don't watch out. We can come down hard. You must obey God. You can't deviate. But then when it comes to a lot of these things, we find ourselves tolerant of evil. Listen to what Isaiah had to say in Isaiah 58.1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Listen, preachers, if you're going to preach, there's a reason you're calling evangelists from young estates. It's to herald out something you want people to know. You have something to say that they need, not just saying something because you've been assigned to speak. The fire burns in your bones. The truth needs to be preached there and needs to be exposed, and you need to show you believe it. I never will remember Brother Gus Nichols saying one time that he heard a man preach. He said it was outlined right. It was systematically presented. And it was just good material. If he had just had a hornet's nest crammed over his head so he preached it. <laughs> Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Israel their sins. Isaiah 58.1. You can't beat sin with a feather duster. False teachers are to be judged with intolerance. Listen to Isaiah again. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I tried out on some brethren who pride themselves in being some of God's favorite sheep. I think they're more sheeple than they are sheep. And much the same way, intolerance is demanded in adhering to God's word today. Paul said this, but to Timothy, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then he plainly said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves itching ears, uh, to teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. That's plain. We need to show what a fable is over and against the truth. We need to have a fighting spirit as the Lord did. I'm not talking about taking up a gun and a sword like the Muslims do and you either become a Muslim or cut your head off. That's not it. But how do you explain the church of our Lord being also described as the army of the Lord? And to put on the whole armor of God. That's a soldier. And Jesus being our chief captain. And Paul saying, I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And what I quoted at the end of the sermon, I guess I can quote it now at the end of this one, sermon this morning. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Second John 10 through 11. You know what that's saying? You don't even have to agree with what this false teacher is teaching. You don't even have to teach it. But just treat him like a faithful brother. And the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle John, who's the Apostle of Love, said that you're right in there with him. You know, when you look at a fighting army, let's just go back to World War II. I don't remember now, 
But for every person with a gun up on the front lines fighting, I forgot how many people were behind them working in supplies. Many, many for everyone up on the front. But they were all in it together, weren't they? Even back here at home, the folks here in this country were urged to do this, buy bonds, do this. You're all in it together. Well, the Bible's clear when it comes to the church. We're all different things in the church. We're like a body. We have different members. But it all works under one head, and we all work to the same thing. You may not be preaching as I am now. You may be a teacher in a classroom. You may not this, that, or the other. But to the best of your ability, according to your talents, you're striving to uphold the truth and not tolerate evil in your life, your family's life, or anybody else's life. And yet you work with people. I don't think that's that hard to understand. You raise your children and you love them. And if you rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you bear with them, but you're always setting a proper example. You're teaching them the truth. They get rebuked and they get exhorted. They get punished at times. It's just what goes. It's what, what's all about. And I see these people say, you don't love that child. You gave him a spanking. I think sometimes that person needs to be taken out and spanked until they learn to have better sense and make such a thing as that. Is there other kinds of discipline to put on children? Certainly. But that's the way the Bible speaks about it. it talks about beating a child and not quitting for his crying. Well, that kind of thing today is hate speech. It's, you get thrown in the jail. I don't know what they'd do if, well, it couldn't happen in America today like it is in Singapore to where they actually take you and cane you if you do certain things. You get sentenced to so many licks of the cane. Oh, how horrible that is. Well, I think it might do some good. Why not? Oh, you see people tremble. Well, they're the ones who probably need beating the most. We've just completely allowed our society to degenerate to the point to where we tolerate evil and call evil good and good evil. That's what's happened. And don't think it won't rub off in the church. We would not be where we are today in the church if people hadn't let that stuff rub off from them to where they don't want to even hear. You realize that sermon I preached this morning could not be preached in a great many pulpits of the Church of Christ because I call names of denominations and expose them. Now, you're pretty used to it around here because Al Brown did it way back there before I came along. It's continued. Not because you want to just do it, but if I'm talking about Baptists, I want to talk about what Baptists believe and I don't want to attribute to them anything they don't believe. But I want to take what they believe that they herald out to the world to save people and compare it to the Bible. That's true of Roman Catholicism, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, or whatever else. I'm obligated to myself and everybody else to take whatever is taught as from God and see if it is. That's a novel idea, isn't it? Imagine somebody says, I'm telling you God's word. Well, let's see. Oh, no, you can't do that. That means you don't love me. You've got to accept me just my statement. Well, that's just wrong. That's all there is to it. And if you read your Bible and believe it for what it is, rightly divided, you know it's wrong. We in the church need to know, the people around us need to know that we'll suffer along with them, but if they bring up error, we're going to show them what's wrong. The same thing's true of our brethren. If they're going to teach error, they need to be shown it's wrong. I can't find anything in the Bible that goes against that. If you think you have, you can let me know. But I can't find anything in the Bible, whether it be the Jews of the days of Moses, fleshly Israel, or whether it's the church. Or go back to the patriarchal age. It simply was not tolerated. And remember Abraham? Take thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest, and I'll offer him a sacrifice. Abraham didn't bat eye. Yet Abraham knew that through him would come all these promises. How's that going to happen? God will take care of it. And Hebrews tells us he thought he'd raise him up from the ashes on the altar to perform all these things that he had to perform through Isaac. But of course God had it all planned out, didn't he? But the faith of Abraham was exercised anyway as his faith was put to the test. When all of these things rise up in your family, in your life personally, in the church, wherever it is, here, wherever it is. 
And it challenges you to stand up for the truth you know the Bible to teach. That's your faith being tested. Will you do it? And so many members have come to this false view of this false spirit of Christ, false love, false confusing better, long-suffering with tolerance, and they compromise. Or they just don't say anything. Sometimes we fail when we have the opportunity to say what ought to be said. We may not have that opportunity again, but we don't. And it's gone. Well, we close the lesson simply saying, let's learn the difference in long-suffering, which all Christians must be, and tolerance. And they should not be tolerant of error in anybody, beginning with themselves. And we're taught, take heed to yourself. First thing Paul said to the elders, take heed to yourselves, then to the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Elders aren't worth their salt if they first don't sit down and say, am I living like I expect the church to live? Am I living and doing what God says elders and elders can do and only they can do? And just bring it right on down. Elders, preachers, deacons, teachers, parents. It has to be that way. Are you a Christian this afternoon? If not, we've studied in this sermon how to become one. If you're a child of God and have sinned, we urge you to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. So again, if you're subject to the great invitation of God, God's allowed you this time to get here. You may not get home, but you've gotten here. And to hear the end of this sermon and offer this invitation, how long-suffering he is. But he's not tolerant of your sins. So if you need to obey the gospel, come to him anyway. Spiritual, we ask you to come now while we sing.